of the Son, the Holy Ghost. Amen. On this great feast of the most blessed Trinity, let us try to say a few, few words about this central mystery of our faith. Unaided human reason can reason to the existence of an all-powerful and an all-perfect God. And we can understand that if he is all-powerful, and if he is all-perfect, then there can be only one of him. It's true that even that much can be a, a difficult thing for our limited human intellects to grasp. But even on that level, there are places that we can start. We can look at God's creation, just the world around us. And in the same way that we can tell about a person by walking through their house, or in the same way that we can tell about a painter by looking at his painting, we can tell something about God the Creator from his creation. But this is only a natural knowledge, and it is difficult to reach. And it only gets us to God as the Creator of nature. It's still keeping us at the level of God as he relates to what is external to himself. All of creation is external to God. To arrive at the internal life of God, God as he is in himself. Well, revelation and faith are absolutely necessary for that. And when we speak of the internal life of God, we are speaking of the mystery of the Trinity. And the basic dogma of the Trinity doesn't sound that complicated. It just says that in God, there is one divine nature and three divine persons. And sometimes that divine nature is referred to as the divine substance or the divine essence. But there's only one God. And there are three divine persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And the dogma goes further. Each is fully God, and hence, each is perfect and co-eternal. None of them came before any of the others. This is why we insist that God the Son is not made. If you say that something is made, then there had to be a maker existing before it. And the maker had to be more perfect than the thing that he made. We don't say that God the Son is made. Rather, we say he's begotten or he's engendered of God the Father. And it's the same thing with the Holy Ghost, with God the Holy Ghost. We say that he proceeds from God the Father and God the Son. But we insist that it's not a procession in time. They've all existed from all eternity. None is temporally before the other. And this is a mystery. It's beyond created human understanding. It's something to be approached with deep humility and deep reverence. But that doesn't mean that we can't use human reason and the teachings of Holy Mother Church to say something about it. And let's try to do that. Let's try to enter a little bit more deeply into this mystery of the Trinity. There's, I'll call it a time-honored tradition, but really it's, it's a joke among priests that young priests are allowed three heresies the first few times that they preach on the Trinity because it's so difficult to grasp and it's so difficult to approach and it's so difficult to talk about. I think that the unwritten corollary of that rule is that older priests probably get three times three heresies. Regardless, that's, a, that's an opinion, and opinions don't belong in sermons. So we've said that this is a mystery, this, this reality of the Blessed Trinity. We've already said that we know there's one God who is all-powerful, all-knowing, all-good. And we've already said that there are three persons in the Blessed Trinity. One God, one divine nature, three, per three persons. 
Now we'll take a step further. And we know that by definition, persons know, and because they know things, they can love what they know. Persons know and love. So let's say a little bit about knowledge in general, and then about how God knows things. And then we'll finish very briefly with speaking about God's love. So we're going to have to get a little bit philosophical here. It won't last long. But when we know something, when when we're thinking about something, the product of that knowledge is called a concept. In everyday English, we usually call it an idea. Yes, I have an idea of what you're talking about. Or yes, I grasp. Or yes, I conceive what you're saying. The product of knowledge is a concept. Now, our ideas, our concepts, are the expressions of the reality of a thing. Whatever it is that we know, our our concepts express that reality. Said another way, they speak, they express the nature of what is known. And that's why the ancient Greeks referred to them as words, mental words. It's why in St. John's Gospel, the last Gospel at Mass, He says, and the word was with God, and the word was God. We'll try to shed a little bit of light on that here very shortly. So when we say idea or concept, the Greeks would have used word. Because we're expressing something, we're saying something in our minds. Now, when we know something, we know it as a representation inside our minds. It's a representation of what's outside of our minds. For example, when we know a tree, well, the tree is still outside of us. In knowing it, we don't change it. It doesn't change because we're contemplating it. The tree itself is outside of our minds, but it does take up a new existence inside of our minds. It becomes a new part of us. But again, I want to insist, we haven't, we haven't, change the tree just because I realize that that tree is green. I'm not taking the greenness of the tree into my mind in a way that makes the tree less green out there. Somehow that greenness is being represented in my mind. And it's being that tree takes up a residence, an existence in my mind, and it becomes a part of me. What we know becomes a part of us. And they're they're ideas, they're concepts that we have. Let me just point out also that with human knowledge, we don't know the things we know perfectly. For instance, in knowing that tree, we don't know how many atoms it has. We don't know exactly how many pounds it weighs. We don't know what its condition was five years ago. We don't know what its condition will be five years from now. So we do know it's a tree and we can grasp the essence of it, but we don't know it in every detail, and it only enters us as a part of us. It doesn't become us, and we don't become the tree. That's human knowledge. Let's try to say something about divine knowledge. We've tried to insist that we have ideas. They become part of us. God is perfectly simple. There are no parts in God. God doesn't have things. God simply is. We've said that God the Father is a person, and we've said that persons know. So what does it mean for God the Father to know? Well, the only thing worthy of his contemplation is himself. It sounds selfish to our human ears, but why would a perfect, divine, omnipotent, eternal person contemplate anything? other than themselves. Nothing else would be worthy. And when the Father knows himself, he knows himself perfectly, not in the way that we know things. So we've said that I know a tree outside of myself and eventually I can express it through a concept or what we often call a mental word. In God the Father, that mental word, that expression of his self-knowledge, 
will be perfect. It will contain all of God. We don't know everything about that tree outside of our heads, but God the Father, in looking at himself, knows everything about himself, every perfection, everything. But it will be God the Father's expression, his word, speaking himself. And it will not be exactly God the Father. It will be the word of God, the second person of the Trinity. That's why we call him the word of the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ. So this is a very difficult concept to grasp. Maybe an example, and it's a poor example, can help just a little bit. Imagine Imagine that we, you can imagine it two ways. One, that we're strong enough to do this or that we have a perfect mirror. But imagine that we look at ourselves in a mirror and that reflection is a perfect reflection of what we are. It has our intellect, it has our will, it has life, it has all of the bodily characteristics that we have, it has all the matter of our body. It's not us. It's a reflection of us. And yet, because it's as perfect as we are, it's another us that can walk off and do its own thing. We've endowed that reflection with all of our perfections. So imagine that infinitely magnified. When God the Father contemplates himself, it will have that, that word, that concept, will have all of his perfections, and it will be a person just as he is, the second person of the Trinity. So, we've gotten from the first person of the Trinity, God the Father contemplating himself, and that, 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 that concept is so perfect that it's a second person. Why do we call him the Son? Why do we call the second person of the Trinity the Son? Well, our Lord taught us to call the first person of the Trinity Father speaks of his father. And also because he is engendered. Not in time, he's not made, he's, he's brought forth, he's engendered by the first person whom we call the father. That's why we call the second person of the Trinity God the Son. So we're almost, we're almost done. One of the things that we have to understand is that once we know something, then and only then do we have the possibility of loving it. And the more perfect our knowledge is of a, of a thing, then the more perfect can our love be. God the Father and God the Son know each other perfectly, and they are all perfect. And thus, knowing all of each other's perfections, they must love each other perfectly and infinitely. And just in the same way that the word of the Father had to be a person, so the love of the Father and the Son must be a person. This is the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Ghost. And again, he has all of their perfections. He exists co-eternally. There was never a moment when any of the persons of the Trinity existed without the other two. And that the Holy Ghost is the eternal personified love of God the Father and God the Son. A sermon on the Holy Ghost would really be another sermon. So we'll, we'll stay with that concerning the Holy Ghost. So just to recap, God the Father is fully God. God the Son is fully God. God the Holy Ghost is is fully God. There is only one God. But God the Father is not God the Son. And God the Holy Ghost is not God the Father, and He's not God the Son. Three persons. And again, I want to insist, it must be approached with deep reverence, deep faith, and deep humility. And let us specifically ask Our Lady to obtain for us those three graces, reverence, humility, and faith, 
and through the graces merited by the redemptive death of her son, that in the next life, along with her and the angels, we can have the eternal joy of contemplating the Blessed Trinity face to face. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen.